Hey everyone, and thanks again for joining us here at the Foundry Church. My name is Justin Colleen, and I'm the worship director here. We are so glad that you're here to see all that God is doing in and through his church right now. If you're looking to stay more connected with us throughout the week, make sure you go and like our Facebook page. There you will find additional content as well as the teachings that you see here on our YouTube channel. And speaking of, if you haven't subscribed for that yet, make sure you do that right now while you're here. Uh, with that said, let's go to our summer series right now, Judah, the Kingdom Chronicles. My name's David. I was a shepherd boy, the youngest of seven. Yet the Lord, the God of Israel, chose me from my whole family to be king over Israel forever. He chose Judah as leader, and from the tribe of Judah, he chose my family. And from my father's sons, he was pleased to make me king over all Israel. declared to me through the prophet. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken away from him. So now, I charge you in the sight of all Israel, and of the assembly of the Lord and in the hearing of our God. Be careful to follow all the commandments of the Lord your God, that you may possess this good land and pass it on as in inheritance to your descendants forever. And I instructed Solomon my son and pled to those who came after to acknowledge the God of your father and serve him with wholehearted devotion and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches every heart and understands every desire and every thought. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will reject you forever. And these are the sons of David, Rehoboam, Abijah, Asa, Jehoshaphat, Jehoram, Ahaziah, Athaliah, Joash, Amaziah, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, Manasseh, Amon, Josiah. And now, Lord God, keep forever the promise you have made concerning your servant and his house. Do as you promise so that your name will be great forever. I am Manasseh, king of Judah for 55 years. I know what to say about me. I did it all. I did worse than anyone before me. I worshiped Baal. I put Asherah poles in the temple of the Lord. I even worshiped the stars. And I took all of Judah with me. They say I killed Isaiah. They say, Shed so much blood, I filled Jerusalem end to end. They say I turned all of Judah away until the whole nation was useless. And they say I am to blame. And it is true. It is true. And I am sorry.
Hey everyone, I am super excited to be with you guys again today. If you haven't seen me around, I am Eric after Worms. Um, <laughs> it's just amazing what Worms can do to your figure after a few weeks of, of that, right? <laughs> Uh, I could say that because Eric is not here with us today, so I'd like it if you would keep that between us. That would be for my best safety. <laughs> if you were with us at all last week, we dove into a king named King Hezekiah. And Eric explained that in King Hezekiah's life, he, he did a lot of great things. It was actually really, really awesome to see a king who listened to the Lord and did what the Lord wanted. Um, and it was kind of a relief to dive into one of those kings. And Eric explained that when King Hezekiah had something come up in his life, a decision that needed to be made, he brought those things before the Lord. So we talked about what does it look like for us to bring our decision decisions and our choices before the Lord. And we're going to be diving into choices a little bit later again today too. Um, but today, we're going to be talking about King Manasseh. And you would think that King Manasseh would be excited to follow after what King Hezekiah did, his dad, what his dad had done well. But he actually starts going down the path of his grandpa. So King Ahaz, he starts doing a lot of the bad things that King Ahaz does. King Ahaz does. Um, and it, have you ever been a part of a situation or have seen a part of a situation that you know is going to be a train wreck? It's like one of those moments that you want to shield your eyes, but you look through it just to see once what's going to happen because you know that something bad's going to happen and you're going to be able to watch it and you can't take your eyes away from it. Sometimes we call those moments train wrecks. Uh, one example is if, if you're excited about football like I am, um, Maybe you watched in 2006, there was an AFC football game. It was the championship football game. And what happened was the Broncos were, or the Patriots were marching down the field, and the Broncos were about to um, try to defend them from getting into the touchdown. And the Broncos end up picking off the Patriots and running it back. You know what? Let's just watch it instead of me trying to explain it. Right, we can see that he would have had a touchdown. Even the announcer, I don't know if you caught it in the middle of the play as he's running it back, says, and he avoided the one person who could get in his way. Right, and out of nowhere, you can see out of his blind shoulder, a defender comes and tackles him and pushes him out at the one yard line. Right, how bad are the Broncos for them to allow this train wreck moment to happen? I'm kind of ripping on the Broncos a little bit because Eric's not here, and it's probably the one time I can actually do that. Because if you've been in Eric's office, he actually has a little bit of a shrine for the Broncos in his office. Yeah, you can even see one of those gnomes that has the Broncos gear on it. It's just ridiculous. <laughs> so, so please, again, keep that between us. We're going to have a few of those today. That We'll just keep this quiet. <laughs> Uh, another example, maybe uh, you're familiar with driving down 131 towards Kalamazoo, and you're driving along, and next to you, there's a big oversized truck that you're going to start to pass, and it's got one of those big dump trucks on it that's really tall, the ones that haul just a ton of dirt, and you're driving down, and all of a sudden, you look ahead, and you're like, oh, no, the this is about to be a train wreck moment. You can't stop it. There's nothing you can do. And Adam's overpass gets smoked again by another oversized truck, right? Like the eighth time this year that that's happened. And it blocks your whole way. You can't get through and changes your day completely. Or maybe you're hiking through a canyon and you are jumping around some rocks and some rocks loosen up and they, you fall and a rock gets stuck in between your arm and the sidewall. Have any of you seen 127 Hours? Yeah, it's a movie about how a guy gets his arm stuck in between a canyon and spends tons of time trying to figure out how to get that off. And I won't recommend that movie for kids, but it is so interesting to see how the hours tick into days and how this man tries to figure out what, what choices do I have here. Moments like that are train wrecks. Right? There are moments that sometimes we have a hard time looking away from. There are moments that we all, 
a lot of time we can't stop them because they're so big. We don't know what to do. Um, your eyes are glued to watch how these things are going to unfold. Train wrecks. Life has a lot of them. When I was in college, I spent a lot of my summers doing camp ministry. And for two summers when I was in college, I worked at Way- in Wayland at Sun Life Camp and just had a blast out there. And I was uh, really fresh into camp ministry and didn't know quite what I was getting into. And so the first week, I was in charge of some middle school boys. And I was so excited, but it didn't take long for me to realize how much energy middle school boys have, especially when they think they're not going to need to get any sleep and they're just going to run all over the place. And as a camp counselor, you realize quite quickly that it's your job to keep them all together and to keep them safe. Right, so I vowed at that time after the parents dropped them off that I was going to do my best to get them back to their parents in one piece. Right, and if they learned about Jesus, that was a bonus. But that wasn't my top priority at that point. As long as they didn't meet Jesus on my time, right? <laughs> See, one of, one of the things we love doing at, when we're at camp is these big camp games where we get the whole camp together and do a big game. And one, one rule that I try to live by in my life is that life isn't fun unless it's just a little bit dangerous. You got to have a little bit of danger to fully live life, live life on the edge just a little bit. And we kind of translated that into some of our camp games when we were coming up with them. And we loved playing uh, capture the flag with the students. But it wasn't quite dangerous enough. Right? We needed to up the ante of that game a little bit. So what we did is we decided to make that game happen at night with glow sticks. And it seemed like a great idea in our head. It made so much sense in our head. It was going to be awesome. There'd be glow sticks running all over the place. It would be safe. It'd be great, right? As night came closer, we realized that there were so many clouds in the sky, so it was actually pitch black. So when we kind of cracked the glow sticks apart, that is the only thing that we could see because we had turned all the lights off. It was dark as can be. And as the game started, we realized that this game that we had created may be a little bit more dangerous than we anticipated. Right, because you can imagine that we, we had one glow stick on each person's arm. But if they put it on their left arm and were running, and if someone else had it on a different arm and they were running too, glow sticks, it takes your eyes just a little bit to adjust as people are running. You can picture that in this huge open field, you hear this faint screaming and yelling as people are clipping each other because they don't know exactly where each other is. And this is the moment we're realizing that, oh no. What are we going to do? That We've already started this game. You're not going to stop them from fl- playing this game because they're so excited about it, but something bad is going to happen. And then it does. I see one of, uh, we have a few athletic guys who are in the game super excited, running all over the place, and one of them gets to the, their enemy's territory and grabs the flag that they're supposed to get. And he's so excited, and he starts running as fast as he can back to their home base. And as he's running, I see another one of my guys who's on the other team, and he sees that happening. So he turns around to block him off before he gets to their home base. And what these boys don't know, because they can't really see each other real well, is that they are going at a very decent clip right towards each other. And they, their, their eyes aren't adjusting to how quickly they're coming and getting close to each other. And we're just watching this in slow motion, and then smack! Those boys hit each other so hard. It was like, oh, no, I can't, I can't believe that just happened. We had a bunch of leaders run up to him right away, and we get down, and one of the guys pops up and says, I'm good. Where's the flag? Let's keep doing this. And the other guy's laying on the ground yet, so I go down on my knee. I'm saying, hey, man, are you okay? And he's looking at me with this, like, shock and pain, and he looks down at me, and he says, I can't feel my legs. I'm like, you what? You can't feel your legs? He couldn't feel his legs. And uh, we laugh at that a little bit now, but it took, we had to end up calling an ambulance, and he was fine after a few days of crutches and letting the feeling go back to his legs. He was walking by the end of the week, and by the time his mom came back to pick him up, which is the most important part. But it was a train wreck moment, right? It was a train wreck moment. And it's, it's one thing 
when those moments are relatively minor, right? When we can look back and we can laugh at those events and think that was funny. It was bad at the time, but we can laugh at it now. But what about those times when you're watching a train wreck and it's not so funny, right? Maybe it's one thing to watch a couple fight on TV and think they're a train wreck. I can't believe that's happening. But it's another to have that happen in your own marriage. It's another to have those arguments with your family. It's another to fight with your kids or your parents and think, this is a train wreck. I, I don't know how to get out of this. This morning, I want to walk you through a story of a train wreck. But this train wreck story isn't one that we laugh about because it's not funny. It's a story about a king who has all the power in all the nations and takes advantage of it by doing the most disgusting things in the world. And if you've been with us at all through this series, you've noticed that a lot of these kings have train wreck stories. They have done a lot of bad things. And through those times, you can say, these kings are train wrecks. And that's going to be a very similar story that we're going to dive into today. Um, because as I was reading through this, that's what was coming up in my head. So let's dive into it. Um, we're going to be reading out of Second Chronicles 33, um, starting at verse 1. And if you have your Bibles, please turn with me there. Second Chronicles 33, verse 1. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 55 years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, following the detestable practice of the nations the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. He rebuilt the high places his father Hezekiah had demolished. He also erected altars to the Baals and made Asherah poles. He bowed down to all the starry hosts and worshipped them. He built altars in the temple of the Lord, of which the Lord had said, My name will remain in Jerusalem forever. In, the, in both courts of the temple of the Lord, he built altars to all the starry hosts. He sacrificed his children in the fire, er, in, the fire in the valley of ben Hinnom, practiced divination and witchcraft, sought omens and consulted mediums and spiritists. He did much evil in the eyes of the Lord, arousing his anger. We talked about Hezekiah, King Hezekiah last week, and about all of the great things he had done. And just like that, the, his son, King Manasseh, undoes all of it. And it's all gone. He brings all that bad stuff that Ahaz was doing right back. Talk about a train wreck. Right? When you think about all of the things that King Manasseh was doing, think about what word sticks out to you. When you're thinking about those things, is there an image that pops into your head? We're going to talk about that in just a sec. But if, if you've been with us at all over the past few weeks, you may have noticed this place being referenced a few times through King Ahaz and King Hezekiah, this place called the Valley of Ben-Hinnom. And I want to show you a few pictures of what this Ben-Hinnom looks like. This first picture is a modern-day picture. Some of you may be surprised by that. They didn't have these kind of big buildings and roads back then. But you have to think that the, this is a little bit of what Jerusalem looked like. And in the center, if you bring up the next slide, you have the Hinnon Valley. And you can see that it's actually quite long and kind of moves around the city a little bit. And the next picture shows an idea of what the inside of that valley looks like. So this is a picture in the valley looking up towards the city. And you can just think, if you've been with us at all over the last few weeks, you know the detestable practices th that are happening in here, especially now that Manasseh's back in charge, all of the just awful things that are happening in this valley. See, two weeks ago, Ahaz, in this very valley, burned sacrifices, as well as his children in this very valley. Then last week we talked about King Hezekiah who tried so hard to get rid of all these Asherah poles and Baal altars. And that all happened in this very same place too. See, he flipped, King Hezekiah, he flipped this kingdom on its shoulders, right? He did a complete 180 to what his dad was doing. 
Why would that be? Did King Hezekiah know what was happening in this valley when his dad was in reign? Do you think he maybe even saw some of his brothers and sisters being sacrificed? Right? Can you imagine what that might have been? Maybe he said, I will never let that happen when I'm in charge. Right? And he doesn't. And he gets rid of all of those things. But then Hezekiah dies. And King Manasseh takes charge and brings all of those things back. Let's talk a bit about this Ben Hinnom place. All right. What's so fascinating for me is when I was learning about this Ben Hinnom place, so many light bulbs popped, on, popped into my head. Anyone want to learn Greek today? That sound like fun? Nope, I don't either. But I'm going to teach you one word that I think is really important to know today. Valley in the Greek language is ga. Ga. Say that with me. Ga. Yeah, even the babies in the room are going to be able to figure that out. Ga, right? Yeah, I got it. I learned Greek. Right? Ga, valley in Greek. So the valley of Ben Hinnom becomes the ga of Ben Hinnom. Or if you shorten it, Gehenna, right? And many of you can think, oh, I I think I've heard that word before. And in fact, Jesus has used that word in his ministry in the New Testament dozens of times. And when Jesus uses this word, he uses it to describe the worst things that could be happening, the worst forms of pain and heartache. Some of you may be thinking, you know, wait, I, I think I'm fairly familiar with a lot of Jesus' words in the New Testament, but I don't recognize the word Gehenna. I don't know that he uses that word all that much. And you're right, because the word Gehenna isn't in our translation. It isn't in the New Testament Gospels. The word that Jesus uses is translated into a different word. Because when the translators, when they were translating the Bible from Greek, the original language that the New Testament was written in, to uh, English, they had to come up with a word that we would be able to understand. What word would make sense to describe some of these scenes? And the word they came up with is hell. Right? They came up with hell. So when you read the word hell in your Bible, nine times out of ten, This Greek word that's being referenced is Gehenna, the Ga of Ben-Hinnom, the Valley of Ben-Hinnom. So when people hear this word, when Jesus is talking about it in the New Testament, what do you think of? What are they thinking of? They have this very literal place, this very literal picture of what hell might have looked like, the very detestable practices of what was happening. See, in Mark 9, we see Jesus telling his disciples that if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off because it's better to enter life maimed than to have two hands go into hell where the fire never goes out. When it says hell, they're picturing Gehenna. They're picturing this location. In Matthew, Jesus criticized the Pharisees for being hypocrites and not practicing what they preached. He called them serpents and vipers and asked how they were going to escape the condemnation of hell. When he's talking to these people, they are picturing the very worst place they know of. They're picturing Ben Hinnom. So this place where children were sacrificed to this disgusting God of Molech, this is the picture for hell. Hell, the place where the worst train wrecks go unhealed. Hell, the place where the very worst of humanity does the very worst things to the very weakest amongst us. And hell, the natural conclusion to a life that's apart from God. You see, 700 years after Manasseh reigned is when Jesus came on the scene. That's when Jesus was doing his ministry. And 700 years after all of these things are happening, people still understand what this valley means, the symbolism behind it. 
See, the, the agonizing cries of helpless victims, the idolatrous celebrations, and so many echoes of death that just encircled this valley of Ben Hinnom. Years would, these centuries would not silence them, right? People understand what happened in Ben Hinnom. And that's Ben Hinnom. That is hell, that world, that the idolatry that King Ahaz brought into life there that King Hezekiah tried so hard to get rid of, and that King Manasseh, the one we're talking about now, just brings right back to life. This is the world that the Jewish people in that day were living. It's a train wreck, and it really doesn't get any better as we continue reading. Verse 7 says this, He took the image he had made and put it in God's temple, of which God had said to David and to his son Solomon, in this temple and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen, so this this is God talking, this is the Lord talking, in this temple and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. I will not make again the feet of the Israelites leave the land I assigned to your ancestors. If only they will be careful to do everything I commanded them concerning all the laws, decrees, regulations given through Moses. So the Lord was talking about that part. And then Manasseh says this, But Manasseh led Judah and the people of Jerusalem astray, so that they did more evil than the nations the Lord had destroyed before the Israelites. See, Second Kings or uh, in Kings twenty-one, there's a very similar story that's talking about Manasseh, and in that story, there's a very specific detail that I think really brings an image that's helpful in describing this scene. It's in twenty-one verse sixteen says this: Manasseh shed very much innocent blood till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to another. And if you think about that that picture of Ben Hinnom, that valley. It's a deep valley and a really long valley that goes throughout and around a lot of the city, right? If, if that's filled, imagine that kind of pain and heartache for that to happen. We have had many kings that have been very, have had amazing beginnings, right? We've heard a lot about kings who have had amazing beginnings, but King Manasseh, yeah, he's not one of them. There's no amazing beginning that's happening here. King Manasseh is a train wreck. Verse 10, the Lord spoke to Manasseh and his people, but they paid no attention. So the Lord brought against them the army commanders of the king of Assyria and took Manasseh prisoner, put a hook in his nose, bound him with bronze shackles, and took him to Babylon. See, Manasseh has lived a life that's a train wreck. So what do you do for you personally? What do you do when you look down the road at your life and realize that your marriage might be heading in that direction? That your finances are heading there? That your addictions, your habits are turning into full addictions? What do you do when the path before you looks like it could be ending in a disaster? The movie I referenced earlier has a path that could end in disaster. 127 Hours is a documentary of a man who's running around in the canyon areas and in the rocks alone. And he seems to be a pretty well-experienced man doing this. And he happens to stumble on some rocks and cause a few rocks to slide and gets his arm caught in between a large rock and the side wall of the canyon. And what happens is he, he doesn't have anyone who knows exactly where he is. This man is literally stuck between a rock and a hard place. Again, I would not recommend this movie for kids, but it's fascinating to see as those hours become days how this man processes some of the things that are happening around him. No one knows where he is. And as every hour passes, it becomes more likely that no one's going to find him, right? He's in a large area that's unexplored. No one's going to find him. And this man, he has two options. He can either die, which is probably the easiest, or 
cut off the very thing that's trapping him. And when you think about those options, it's often easier to just quit, right? Because the pain of having to go through cutting off something that that is holding you back, that's stuck in a hard place, is often so much harder than it is to just let it be and not deal with it, even if it kills you. It's easier to work a few more hours at night than it is to spend time with kids who are hard to deal with because you just you just stay in the office and don't want to don't want to go home. It's easier to turn on Netflix when you know that your marriage needs attention and it's easier to zone out into someone else's life into someone else's paradise than it is to look at your own and try to work out the problems of your own. It's easier to have another smoke, to have another drink, to click on another website than it is to go through the withdrawals of not having some of those things. See, we often have two options when it comes to us being in a situation that puts us in between a rock and a hard place, between a train wreck moment, you could say. See, Manasseh's at his low. Right? He is at the very low he could be. He's being hauled off into exile. And he really has two options left. He can stay in exile or he can call out to God. Right? And if you think about those two options, if I was in Manasseh's place, put yourself in that place, I would probably just stay in exile. Right? I mean, the man has done so many un just awful things towards God, right? He has worshipped tons of different false gods. He has brought the nation around him to worshiping those false gods too. He has sacrificed so many things that we can't even think about. And yet, he has two options yet. And this is what he does. Verse 12, in his distress, he sought the favor of the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his ancestors. Finally, such a relief, right? He finally called out to God. He made the right choice. But isn't it too late? Right? Like we know the undetestable things that King Manasseh has done. There's no way that God would answer that call. He's done so many awful things. Verse 13 says this, And when he prayed to him, the Lord was moved by his entreaty and listened to his plea, so that he brought him back to Jerusalem and to his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord is God. Afterward, he rebuilt the outer wall of the city of David west of the Gehinnon Spring in the valley. As far as the entrance of the fish gate and encircling the hill of Opal, he also made it much higher. He stationed military commanders in all the fortified cities in Judah. He got rid of the foreign gods and removed the image from the temple of the Lord, as well as all the altars he had built on the temple hill in Jerusalem. And he threw them out of the city. Then he restored the altar of the Lord and sacrificed fellowship offerings and thank offerings on it and told Judah to serve the Lord, the God of Israel. Such a beautiful ending to a horrible story, isn't it? But there's always a choice. The guy who had his arm stuck in between a rock and a hard place, he had a choice. Manasseh, who was being dragged off into exile, had a choice. And we have a choice. So the question is, what is your choice? Often the easier choice is the one we are most comfortable with even if it doesn't get us to a better destination. It's an easy way to just go out. Trust me, this is something that I'm challenged with too. And I often find as I'm preparing a sermon that a lot of the things that I'm challenging everyone else with is the very thing that God wants to point out in my life. And when I think about me, I think that when, when I get home at night, sometimes all I want to do is just plop down on the couch and watch Netflix even though it's going to be a whole lot more better for my marriage to sit and have a conversation with my wife, to take my dog for a walk and enjoy creation like I like to do it. It's being in creation, enjoying some of those things. And yet, if I'm honest, 
when I do sit down and watch Netflix and zone out, I can't tell you in the last six months of doing that what benefit that's actually gotten me. Right? I can't even tell you some of the shows I've watched because it, like, I just zone out to them. They, there's no benefit to me, and that's the choice I'm making. Right? What would be the better choice? How do I spend that time with the people that I love or spend that time with God? But it's a choice. And I'm assuming as long as you haven't zoned out that in the last 10 minutes there has been something that has popped into your head. Right? Maybe it's a choice that you've been avoiding to make for a little bit. That's one that you don't want to address. Maybe it's a choice that you've been making the wrong one for a while, and today you're thinking, you know, maybe it's time I make a different choice in that. I don't know what choice you are struggling with today, but what I do know is that it is never too late to make the right choice. And I don't know what that right choice is for you, but if we've learned anything from the story of King Manasseh, it's that it is never too late to make that right choice. So, the question I leave you with today, what is that right choice? What does that mean for you? Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word and the story of King Manasseh and how even though he did some awful things for a lot of his life, that in the end, even when he cried out to you, you were there, and you brought him out of exile and knew, made sure he knew that you were always there for him. I ask that as we look into our life and we look at what choices we may have been avoiding or choices that we know are coming and we need to make, that we make those choices with you in mind, even if that means that it's going to be a bit of a harder path, that it's going to mean some tough conversations that it's going to mean some hard things that need to happen in that choice. I ask that you're with us in those decisions and help us know that you're there for every step of that. In your name we pray. Amen. Friends, we live in a world where there are choices coming around us constantly. There's small choices and there's big choices, and we have to make decisions all the time. But I hope that over the last half hour, there's been a choice that's kind of come into your mind that maybe you've been trying to avoid or you've been making the wrong choice for a bit. I want you to think this week, how, how can I make that choice now or how can I make that choice differently? And even take what Eric talked about last week about King Hezekiah and how he laid it before the Lord and what we learned from King Manasseh about making some choices right what would it look like to lay our choices before the Lord and have him give us input, input about what's going on in our lives? Think about those things this week as you go into your work week. Uh, leave with this final blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, go in peace. Have a great week. Hey, thanks again for joining us for today's message. If you are looking for a way to prepare yourself for next week's message, make sure that you click the link below in the description right now and that'll take you to our weekly devotion page. Weekly devotions are a very important part to our weekly rhythm here at the Foundry Church. We really hope that God spoke to you in a powerful way today and we cannot wait to see you again next week.